Hey, whoa. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at this. I didn't realize we had this funky dynamic background going on. Whoa, this is going to be hard on the head. Maybe I shouldn't have brought you here already. <laughs> I won't stay on the screen too long. Um, other than basically, you know, this is just going to be a quick, uh, a quick beginning to lecture seven. And I'm really just hearkening back to something I've already told you in chapter one. Um, but I just want to reinstate this context because I think it really is important to understand, um, you know, where things were historically when behaviorism and um, everything you're going to learn about in chapter seven really took off. And, and when you understand the context, you have a better understanding of how it became so dominant within psychology, at least in North America. Um, this was the dominant approach to studying psychology for whew, 30 to 40 years. Um, psychology really kind of became this. And this is, you know, some people call this rat psychology. Um, it's, it's, you'll know some of the stereotypes from it. But how did this happen? How did psychology come to embrace behaviorism as deeply as it did? Well, in order to understand that, you really do need to understand some history. And what I've got here is a specific history. This is sort of the history of... Um, well, our knowledge of DNA and genes and all that kind of stuff. And so it starts when we kind of get over here. It starts, according to this timeline, by the invention of the optical microscope, which allowed you, which is kind of interesting, right? I highlighted things like the EEG systems in the sleep chapter, but every science, the instruments are really important. And, and so having the optical microscope at, at 1595 was important because then we saw cells um, in 1665, we were able to actually see that, that our bodies were made up of much smaller matter called cells. Now, it was within roughly this context, um, well, 200 years after the microscope, really, uh, when 200 plus years after the microscope, when Darwin published uh, The Origin of the Species. And again, the important thing to, to, to understand pre-Darwin pre is that people were kind of using genetics for a long, long time, I mean centuries, as long as horse racing, you know, what's the history of horse racing? I don't know, uh, but at some point relatively early in the history of horse racing, we call it the sport of kings, right? Very often the heads of countries and stuff they would get together and they would race their fastest horses. Uh, and I suspect this goes way, 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 way back in time. Now, when, do, when did um, what we call natural, sorry, artificial selection start? Uh, I'm not sure, but at some point, somebody had the idea that if we want to have especially fast horses, Maybe what we should do is, is find the really fastest horses we have now, the fastest male horses and the fastest female horses, and we should get them to breed. Get the fastest males and the fastest females to breed. Now, of course, you know, it's, it's called artificial selection because some human being chose which animals were going to breed and then basically put them together until they did breed. Um, and, um, they found very early on that the logic worked, that if you had, you know, the fastest horse, the fastest male horse, and the fastest female horse, you had them produce children, their children tended to be much faster than average. And so if you continue to breed fast horses um, to one another, um, then, then you got faster and faster race horses. So people were doing this with race horses. They were doing it with dogs because, you know, the original dogs were wild, uh, but we wanted to use them to, as sort of work companions, as hunting companions, as all sorts of things. And so through again, successive breeding or, or, or what we call artificial selection with the humans deciding, you know, which pair would mate, um, they were able to create all these different, what we now call breeds of dogs, you know, that all have a very distinct look and behavior pattern. So all of that was happening before Darwin. And that already showed that there was something being handed down from ancestors to their children, you know, in some way. Still didn't know what it was. 
Darwin published The Origin of the Species, and really the only twist Darwin added to the story was the idea of natural selection. That, yes, with the breeding, it was always a human choosing which two would mate. Um, but maybe in nature, there's a natural version of that. Maybe animals do not mate randomly. Do you mate randomly? Are you just randomly attracted to people? Or are there certain characteristics of the kind of people you are attracted to that you find especially attractive. Um, you know, so we're, we're people attracted to, say, physically fit, stronger individuals, both, you know, whoever it may be, male or female, were they attracted to more fit individuals? Um, if they were, then over generations, we would see fitter human beings, right? Just, just like the artificial breeding, except now it's natural selection. And so as long as the individuals within some community did not show, did not mate randomly, but rather found certain traits especially attractive, then we could have a version of, of the horse breeding and the dog breeding, but one that happens in a much more natural way. And that's really what Darwin postulated. He still didn't know how it happened. He didn't know how traits were handed down. That was really Gregory Mendel in 1865. So a little while later, Mendel was the one um, to really introduce these, these fundamental laws of inheritance and, and bring up the whole idea of DNA and that sort of stuff. Um, and then we see things kind of take off. And so by 1902, chromosomes and cancer relationship has been proposed. So there's some link between DNA uh, and cancer. Um, in 1910, Hunt showed that genes were located in chromosomes. In 1953, Crick and Watson described the structure of DNA. In 56, Levon and Tiho reported the human chromosome number was 46. They knew how many chromosomes we had. Um, in 1959, we found that trisomy 21 um, was a you know a very specific genetic flaw uh, was associated with Down syndrome. Um, I have a nephew with Down sy syndrome. I know it well. Um, in 1977, we have the Sanger sequencing method to actually get at the DNA. Uh, and so all of this to say, okay, we're already sort of past the point I want to be at. We want to be around here, okay? And, and right around this time, this is when behaviorism that we're going to talk about started to be. And right around this time was really a time of great excitement since Darwin. You know, Darwin and Mendel and, and everybody was really excited about, wow, we understand how traits are passed down from human to human. And so this is really what we'd call the nature side of that nature-nurture debate, right? Really focused on the effect of biology and how much of you is the result of the genes that you inherited from someone else. And the scientific community was all abuzz about this. Um, and it, of course, it led to, and I've highlighted this before, this notion, so this is what I call the era of nature, uh, but it led to this notion of eugenics, where people started to, to think, wow, wouldn't we love the human race to be the best it could be? Um, if, if we want that, from what we now understand about genetics, we can make that happen. All we have to do is what's been done over and over again choose the people who have the characteristics that we value and let those people breed just like the racehorses the racehorses it was speed right but maybe with humans what do we value is it creativity is it intelligence is it you know certain appearance things etc the claim is if you could come up with a list of those things you value and if you could figure out who has those traits, you know, you could measure every human being and figure out where they stand on these traits we value. And then if you could somehow preferentially get the ones that are high on those traits to, to be the ones producing the children of the future, then the children of the future would have all of these traits in greater abundance than we do now. Okay, that's the basic logic. Here's the scary thing. The logic is accurate. You know, the logic holds. And I say that's scary because even though we turned against genetics for the eugenics for the reasons I'll describe in a moment, the logic is still there. 
Um, and, and, and it's worrisome that someone else is going to pick up the mantle and, and start pushing this again. Of course, the problem, I hope you, you understand as I kind of describe stuff, is well, who decides which values we we value, <laughs> which, sorry, which traits we value. You know, do we value empathy? I think so. I hope so. Um, but, you know, there, there's all these ways people vary, and who's to say that a certain way of being is the best way? So there are a whole debates around that, first of all. What are these traits we imagine the perfect human race having? Um, and secondly, okay, once you kind of know what traits you want, how are you actually going to do the selective breeding thing? You know, how are you going to either encourage the right people to have children or discourage the wrong people, the people who don't have the traits you want? These became the issues that were being discussed amongst the scientific community, again, in things like formal conferences. Um, here's the first international eugenics conference, July 24th to the 30th, 1912. Okay, so just a little, you know, this this is post-Darwin, again, post-Mendel, um, but pre-somebody else we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, and, that, and that's the sort of period where it's happened. So this was a li live intellectual debate. Not only was it an intellectual debate, it was happening. Um, so here's a, a, a little girl that theoretically um, was a triumph for eugenics, they say. So this is one where a couple of perfect parents, perfect parents that had the traits they wanted, um, had this little girl um, who won state awards at the Salem Fair. And she tells how she brought up her daughter that she might prove to become a healthy young woman. Okay, whatever. Here's a scarier side. Um, there were issues like this, forced sterilization. And, you know, you see protests like this in America today uh, of various sorts, people holding up signs for various things, and they were then as well. There were actual attempts to make sure that the, the people who were deemed not to have the traits would, would not be able to produce more children. And, you know, not surprising, this fell on certain racial and cultural groups, especially, you know, raising a lot of those issues. So... You know, this was happening in America. Um, I'm not sure how much it was happening in Canada, to be honest. Um, I, I should know better. I should know a little bit about the history of eugenics in Canada. But it was certainly happening in America, and there was a lot of discussion about this. And again, beyond discussion, actual things starting to happen. And that's, of course, when, you know, I said between Darwin and this other guy, who is this other guy? This other guy. So, you know, this was the guy that sort of made everybody realize just how scary eugenics was. Um, because while other people were debating the values and debating mechanisms for trying to make eugenics happen, this guy didn't debate anything at all. Um, he just defined the, the, the characteristics, and, and he really saw those as the Aryan race, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed German sort of stock, as he called it. He thought that is what the perfect people of the future would look like. Um, that is the sort of cultural background they would have, and anybody else was deemed inferior. And the further they were from that, you know, view of the perfect uh, person, um, well, the more extreme his measures, because, you know, while other people were saying things like, well, do we sterilize or do we just encourage certain people to breed? You know, Hitler took it a step further and said, you know, those people who have the characteristics that we don't want, we're just going to eliminate. We're going to prevent them by breeding, by preventing them from living, in a sense. Uh, and, and you know, when, when people kind of understood, this, this was at the root of everything Hitler did, right? He, his, his goal. I always say this to people. If you meet someone we all consider evil, like Hitler, don't be surprised that they don't think they're evil. And, and I'm sure Hitler would have told you that he is some sort of hero bringing about the transition of the human species into its perfect form. 
um, that everything he was doing was justified given the, the result that he thought he was going to have. And, you know, again, it was really that that made the rest of the world kind of sit back and go, oh my goodness, that's where this eugenics path leads. Um, we see the future and we reject it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, obviously Hitler had to be defeated and blah, blah, blah. That all happened. Um, but then, you know, um, people were turning back from eugenics. And so when was this? This was World War II, right? 1940s, late 1940s, um, and and then that ended, and when that ended, chapter seven begins. <laughs> okay, chapter seven, really, uh, and especially John Watson, the the head of the behaviors unit really was operating as a reaction to everything he had just seen. This embracing of nature and genetics um, as though that were all that you needed, as though that were all that mattered. And um, Watson was there to say, no, no, it's not just about nature. Um, it's about nurture too. And in fact, nurture may be every bit as powerful of, as nature, if not more so. We are not condemned to being a certain person because of our genetic inheritance, okay? So that's the context for chapter seven. Um, and with that as context, I think you'll, you'll be able to understand as we talk through, you know, why behaviorism came, became the force that it did.